there's a difference between practice for the sake of rebirth, a good rebirth, and practice for the sake of going beyond all rebirth. But there are also some similarities. The Buddha talks about four qualities that are conducive to a good rebirth. Conviction, virtue, generosity, discernment. And there's a lot of overlap there with the path to the end of suffering, especially in the virtue and the discernment. And also in the sense that as you're Following those four practices that lead to a good rebirth, the Buddha is encouraging you to learn how to look at your mind. After all, conviction. What is the message of conviction? Think about the Buddha's three knowledges on the night of his awakening. The first two knowledges have to do with rebirth. And the important message was that they were fueled by karma. Where you went was determined by your actions. And your actions were very complex. There were cases the Buddha saw where people had done good in this lifetime, but then they went to a bad destination. Some cases where they had done bad things in this lifetime, they go to a good destination. The people before him had seen those cases and they said, well, it's totally random. Your actions have nothing to do with your destination. But he looked more carefully. And so those people had other actions in their previous lifetimes, or in times before those actions in this lifetime, or after those actions in this lifetime. Or they changed their minds at the moment of death. And those people who had done bad things suddenly developed right view at the moment of death. And vice versa, those who had done good things slipped off into wrong view. That taught him a lesson, that a mental action can have a lot of power, and what, what you do in the present moment can, have, can fight against a lot of things that you've done in the past. That's an important lesson to keep in mind. That it's your actions, mental actions, that matter, and they can have a lot of power. Of course, we see this in the third knowledge, when the Buddha gained insight into the Four Noble Truths, that the cause of suffering isn't aging, illness, and death, and it isn't what people do outside, or it isn't just bad sights, sounds, smells, taste, taste, or tactile sensations. It's your craving and clinging. The big issue is inside. So if you really have conviction in the Buddha's awakening, it means you have to focus on your mind. Because the mind in the present moment has a lot of power. Same with the principle of virtue. When you take the precepts, you're basically setting up an intention. And it's your intention that's going to make all the difference if you change your intention. So you have the intention not to kill, but then you intend to kill. You intend not to lie, but then you intend to lie. It's the intention that's broken the precept. If you happen to say something that's untrue but you don't know it, it doesn't break the precept at all. You step on some bugs without knowing it, you don't break the precept. So the fact that you've taken the precepts keeps directing your mind back to observing itself. What is it doing right now? Our problem is we get so in tangled in sight, sound, smell, taste, tactile sensations, we forget to observe the mind that's going after these things. I think I've told you about that time when a monk from Bangkok came to stay at Wat Damasit. It was one evening when the sunset was particularly nice. The sun was low in the sky, it was golden, sending shadows across the fields. And he commented, the place is really really not bad. It's really beautiful. 
Then John Fung immediately said, well, look at what's saying that it's beautiful. That's the important thing right now. I think of that story of the monk going down to bathe in, the, in a pond, and there was a lotus in the pond. He bent over to sniff the lotus, and a deva appeared. He said, you just stole the scent of that flower. And the monk's immediate reaction was, oh, come on, that's not stealing. And the deva said, if you're really intent on gaining freedom, you have to see even the slightest fault as, as huge as a cloud. The monk came to his senses. He said, well, thank you very much. If you see me making any other mistakes like that, please let me know. And she said, well, I'm not your servant. You're looking after yourself. And she disappeared. And her point is right. He should be looking after his own mind. That's why we have the precepts, not only to make life better for ourselves and for the people around us, but also to focus our attention our, on our intentions. What do we mean to do? Because that's the difference between breaking a precept and not breaking a precept. Similarly with generosity. There are different factors that go into determining how much you're going to benefit from an act of generosity, but a huge factor is your motivation. In the beginning it seems a little bit like a catch-22. The Buddha says that when you're generous, you benefit in this lifetime and you benefit in future lifetimes. But it turns out that the lowest motivation for generosity that the Buddha talks about that would get you into heaven is the idea that you will gain what you gave back in the next lifetime. Now the Buddha is not saying this bad, it's just it's not the most productive motivation. He goes up from there that the thought that giving is good, or these people are poor and hungry, and I have more than enough, it's not right that I don't share with them. The motivations go higher and higher, and the reward in the next lifetime gets higher and higher as well. But the focus is more and more on the state of the mind. Giving feels good. The mind is made serene. It's gratified by giving. Giving is an ornament for the mind. It keeps pointing back more and more to the mind. Because after all, if you're going to be observing the mind, it's best to start out with, as you observe yourself doing good things, like observing the precepts and being generous. Because you'll be more willing to look at it then. Of course, when you get used to looking at it when it's doing good things, then when it starts thinking bad things, things that are unskillful, you tell yourself, I don't want to look at this. And as I say, if you don't like the news, we'll make some good news of your own. You don't just sit there and put up with a bad mental state. You realize that you can change it. Because underlying all these qualities, of course, is discernment, what the Buddha calls penetrative discernment into arising and passing away. Now that doesn't mean you just simply watch what comes and what goes and leave it, leave it at what comes and what goes. To be penetrative, your knowledge has to deal with the causes, what's causing things to arise, what's causing them to pass away, and also with gradations. What actions are worth doing, which ones are not worth doing? Which mental states are worth cultivating? Which ones are not worth cultivating? So if you get used to living your daily life like this, looking at your intentions, looking at the mind, then it gets a lot easier to settle down and meditate. And when you're meditating, you have the alertness to watch the mind, to make sure that it stays with its object. And having that ability to step back and observe yourself will serve you in good stead. It's, it's that ability that allows you to improve your concentration and to begin to learn how to analyze the concentration when it's gotten really good.
So the practice is seamless. Everything the Buddha teaches us is, as he says, is contained in the Four Noble Truths. And the message of the Four Noble Truths is again and again and again. The causes for suffering are in the mind. The path to the end of suffering starts in the mind. It starts with right view. So the Buddha keeps pointing you back. Observe your mind. Observe your mind. That's how you grow in the Dharma.